Hey everyone, today I want to talk about The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. But since this isn't a gaming channel, I figured we could all learn about a culture that Tears of the Kingdom took inspiration from. The Nazca. If you're like me, when you think about the Nazca, you think of their famous geoglyphs that cover the desert floor. These glyphs stretch for miles and it's not until you take to the sky and get a bird's eye view that we truly appreciate their scale. Unfortunately for the Nazca, the lines have sort of become their identity. Which is a shame, because the Nazca were an incredibly brilliant and innovative culture. With advancements in archaeology, some of the best pottery in the region, and most impressively, a water management system that allowed them to thrive in one of the driest places on the planet. Don't worry, I'll cover their famous lines, I'll throw it under art or something. But this video is about the brilliance of the Nazca people. Which also means I won't be covering that other thing they're famous for. But I'm getting ahead of myself. To better understand their culture, let's take a look at the world the Nazca lived in. The Nazca lived in southern Peru roughly 2,000 years ago, from about 100 BC to 800 AD. They rose from another culture called the Paracas who lived along the western coast. The area is subjected to strong storms called El Niños. These dangerous storms occur every decade or so and cause major flooding throughout the region. Massive floods can be devastating and are believed to be one of the reasons the Paracas people moved inland, eventually transitioning into the Nazca. Peru can be divided into three regions. To the west lies a coastal desert where the Nazca and the Paracas settled. This region was divided by several river valleys that connected the land to the Pacific Ocean. Running through the center of Peru spans the Andes Mountains. These mountains help protect the Nazca from their encroaching neighbors to the east. Beyond the mountains to the east, Peru meets up with the western edge of the Amazon rainforest. So that's the landscape. But who were their neighbors? Well, if you're familiar with the Inca, the Wari are believed to be their precursors. They were not yet a vast empire like the Inca, but they certainly had ideas for territorial expansion. However, the Andes Mountains acted as a natural barrier between the Wari and the Nazca, imposing a geographical limit on expanding westward. To the north of the Nazca lived the Moche. Like the Wari, the Moche were a culture ready for expansion, but thankfully the Nazca would once again be protected by geography. Between the Nazca and the Moche lies a vast desert, the lack of fertile land kept the Moche from moving further south. Finally, we have Hoboy. Okay, let's just get it out there. Lake Titicaca. Throughout the time period the Nazca would live in the region, two cultures would live alongside this massive lake. To the north were the Yaya Mama people, famous for their impressive ceremonial buildings completely made out of stone. On the southern edge of the lake, another culture emerged called the Teahuanaco. Eventually the Teahuanaco people would come to engulf the entire lake, likely thanks to their advancements in agriculture. It's important to note that none of these cultures were isolated. They all shared similar artwork and religious iconography, and they all likely traded with each other. Okay, so that's the world the Nazca lived in. But what about the Nazca themselves? The Nazca settled on the western edge of Peru, roughly 70 kilometers inland. As mentioned earlier, we believe the Nazca rose from the Paracas people who lived on the coast. These two cultures shared a lot in common. They both had shaft tombs, similar artwork and textiles, as well as similar religious deities. The Nazca lived in several small villages throughout various river valleys. These villages were about four acres in size with houses set atop terraces along the riverside. Some of these houses would have been made of stone or adobe, but usually they were made out of thatch and wood. The wood they used was cultivated from a local mesquite tree called the Horango tree. The two most important archaeological sites for the Nazca are the great city of Ventila and the massive ceremonial site called Coachi. Ventila expands over two square kilometers. The city had hundreds of terraces and several small-sized pyramid structures. Near the center of the city was a large central plaza enclosed by a wall. Beneath the city were family tombs. Like the Paracas, the Nazca mummified their dead and would maintain a family crypt below ground. These shaft tombs were three to four meters deep and were closed with a wooden roof. The mummies would have been wrapped in beautiful textiles and buried alongside pottery. It's actually from these artifacts that the archaeologists have learned much of what we know about the Nazca. In addition to Ventila, the other important archaeological site for the Nazca is called Coachi. Coachi is located on the southern banks of the Nazca River. Like Ventila, Coachi has several medium-sized pyramids as well as a large open plaza. But something is missing. Where are all the people? This is a ghost town! Just kidding. We are about a thousand years too late for that. But even if you were to visit Kawachi back then, you might not find the city occupied. The city doesn't appear to have any residential buildings. Instead what we find is a lot of pottery and event spaces, evidence of large gatherings, but nothing to suggest anyone actually lived in this city full time. I like to think of Kawachi as Burning Man. This place was one big celebration. What were they celebrating? We don't really know. 
but the location of Kawachi might yield some clues. One of the famous Nazca lines called Camino de la Guia connected Kawachi to the other large Nazca city of Ventila. The city is also located right next to the plateau that marks the start of the Nazca lines. So, one theory is maybe they came to Kawachi to hold a giant festival before setting out to the desert to create new lines. Whatever its purpose, Kawachi shows the Nazca were an incredibly successful culture. I mean, anyone who can build and maintain a city-sized venue space in the middle of the desert must be doing something right. But how do they do it? How do you survive in the desert? How do you find food? To answer this question, let's take a look at the region the Nazca occupied. The land is largely a coastal desert, with several river valleys that connect to the Pacific Ocean. You might be tempted to see these rivers that connect to the ocean and think, say, I bet they were a fishing culture. Easy access to the ocean, and even one of their most popular iconographies appears to be a whale. There we go, case solved. The Nazca were hunting large marine animals, whales, fish, sharks. Sharks? Wait, is this a plug? If you're interested in sharks, please check out my last video after watching this one. It covers the evolution of sharks and how they managed to survive every major extinction for the past 400 million years. Okay, back to the Nazca. It turns out the Nazca were not a coastal culture made up of fishing villages. Instead, what we see is a civilization built on agriculture. This brings up a serious problem. Remember, this is a desert, not exactly fertile land. In fact, the Moche to the north avoided expanding into this territory due to the lack of arable land. How do you build a culture on agriculture in the middle of the desert? The Nazca had a problem, and the solution wasn't as obvious as it might seem. If you're like me, you see those rivers and think, bingo, it's like the Nile in Egypt. That's where we'll find their villages. They must have used the river systems. And they did. However, rainfall in this region is very unpredictable. You might get good rainfall from January to April, but then everything dries up. On top of that, droughts frequent the area, meaning you could have some years with no rainfall at all. Most cultures solve this by planting crops that use very little water. Think figs in the Mediterranean. However, the Nazca had a very diverse diet, cultivating products like squash, maize, sweet potatoes, and manioc. By the way, manioc's actually the ingredient in tapioca pudding. It's also poisonous, and it grows in swamps. This is the desert. How did they? And wait, what about the poison? Why would they put this stuff in my pudding? It turns out manioc is perfectly safe to eat once it's been processed. To remove the toxins, you simply soak the plant in water and then hang it out to dry. Rinse and repeat until the poison drops off with the water. If this sounds like a very water-intensive crop for a region frequent with drought, you're right. The Nazca were farming and cultivating crops not native to the region. They were farming in the desert, and they did so with one of the most impressive engineering achievements in South America. The Nazca aqueducts. Aqueducts? I know those. The Romans made them. You're right, they did. What? You think I'm going to take away from the Romans? They copied great stuff. Appreciate them. While the use of aqueducts has been used by various other cultures, including those in the Middle East, the system built by the Nazca is truly impressive and, as we'll soon see, provided the Nazca people with easy access to fresh water. To build this system, the Nazca would dig a horizontal well called a pokios into the side of a mountain or hill. The construction of these pokios was an engineering marvel. The wells had to be dug at a precise angle, too low, and the water would flow too quickly, picking up sediment and turning it into silt. Too high, and the water flow might come to a complete stop. But the Nazca found the sweet spot. In order to prevent water loss, the walls of the wells were lined with tightly packed rocks both above and below ground. Now, if the Nazca had stopped here, this alone would have been an impressive feat of engineering. But there's another problem. What if you live here? Do you have to come down the hill to collect the water? How far away were the collection pools? What's the point of moving water if it just bypasses your village? Once again, the Nazca had the answer. To solve this problem, the Nazca dug spiral holes called ojos. These ojos acted like spiral staircases that allowed direct access to the running water for those high above the collection pool. It's incredible, and the best part? This whole system is still working today. In fact, the system is so robust that the entire area has seen a recent resurgence. The people moving back to the area can trace their origins to the Nazca people themselves, and while they face many challenges, their ancestors left them an impressive legacy. Their culture is filled with incredible agriculture achievements, impressive engineering, and a rich history of art and pottery. Nazca pottery was something to behold. Take a look at this vase. You'll notice I've drawn the Nazca vase with a brighter hue. This was very easy to do on the computer, but for ancient cultures, computers were still a few years away. To achieve the vibrant colors and hues associated with Nazca art, the Nazca developed a unique method of painting their pottery. This allowed them to paint their pieces before putting them in the kiln, resulting in a vibrant polychromatic art style that's distinct to the Nazca. Also unique to the Nazca was the creation of the double stirrup vessel. 
decorating these vessels were elaborate lines, depictions of animals, and other religious iconography. Wait a second, where have I seen this? <gasps> the aliens, they ripped off the Nazca when designing their lines. Could a culture with identical iconography to the lines that arose from another culture who also participated in the creation of geoglyphs throughout the desert really be responsible for all this? Yes. Do we have any evidence? We do actually, this stuff. Trash, it's everywhere. They left pottery and survey markers all throughout the lines. It was them, the Nazca made these, and the Paracas made these, and like the Nazca, they left their trash in their lines as well. So it's not aliens, it's scaled images of popular iconography used throughout their culture. Now let's talk about the lines themselves. How did they last so long? The answer, it's dry. The area receives almost no rainfall. The only water the area sees is from strong storms that flood the region. Wait a second. If the flood reaches the lines, that sounds like a lot of water. Wouldn't that destroy the lines? Why yes, it would. In fact, it does. Many of the Nazca lines have been destroyed by flooding. The reason we still have so many is simple. They're higher up. Most of the lines we're familiar with were created on an elevated plateau that protected the lines from the regional flooding. The scale of the lines is truly impressive, spanning over 1300 kilometers across a vast desert. Most of these are simply straight lines. Some intersect, some are parallel, and some seem to span out from a central point. But that's not why you're here. You're here because of this. Well, half of you are here because of this. But for the rest of you, it's the giant geoglyphs depicting animals sprawled across the desert that captures your eye. The largest among the geoglyphs is the one I keep showing, the giant hummingbird. It extends over 200 meters, larger than two football fields, and like the rest of the glyphs, is made from one continuous line. We still don't know the purpose of these lines, but the theory I like is that they were ceremonial pathways the Nazca used for various celebrations. That also fits what we see at Kawachi. But for whatever their purpose, the Nazca lines remain a mystery even to this day. As for the Nazca people, we believe a combination of El Nino storms and encroaching neighbors might have caused their downfall. In the final years of the Nazca, the amount of Wari imagery seen throughout the Nazca region started to increase. Which could only mean one thing, the Wari managed to find a way through the mountains. The Wari had made significant breakthroughs in farming technology and would literally reshape the region. It's called terrace farming, and it involves the process of carving out the sides of mountains to create flat land more suitable for farming. This impressive innovation allowed the Wari to expand past the Andes Mountains and build a foundation the Inca Empire would eventually inherit. But who were the Wari? Normally, this is where I make a joke and say, unfortunately, we're out of time. But the Wari are so important, I think it's appropriate to cover their entire written history in this video. Okay, that's it. Unlike other cultures, the Wari didn't have a written history. Their form of communication was completely unique. But unfortunately, we're out of time. So I guess we'll have to cover the Wari in another video. Until then, I'm Napkin. Thank you for watching. I hope to see you next time. And don't forget to bring snacks.